Encompass Live. I'm Emily Nimsicott, filling in for your regular host, Krista Burns. Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly online event. Our sessions cover NLC activities and other library topics, and they're presented by NLC staff or special guests. The one-hour sessions are free and offered every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time, and they include a mixture of presentations, interviews, book reviews, web tours, and Q&A sessions. Today our title is Reflections on PLA, and we have several special guests with us. We have joining us over the web Mary Jo Mack, the director of John A. Stahl Library in West Point. And we also have four librarians here from Lincoln City Libraries, Carol Swanson, uh, Mary Luckner, Carrie Simpson, and Tammy Teasley. And they will all be talking about their experiences attending the Public Library Association Conference. We're going to start off with a guest from here at the Commission, Laura Johnson, our Continuing Education Coordinator, who will tell us a little bit about the grants that made it possible for all of these librarians to attend PLA. Laura? Thanks. Hi, this is Laura. Uh, I just wanted to say a few words. Um, we do give continuing education and training grants every year. Um, we're hoping to be able to continue this, even though uh, we may have kind of a uh, straightened budget situation next year. But uh, we think that continuing education and training grants are very important because they help librarians improve their library service um, by getting them out of their normal, um, I don't want to say ruts. I don't think we're in ruts. I really don't. But by helping them uh, go to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. Um, we were happy to be able to send five people to uh, the PLA meeting this year, and as part of the grant, they agreed to share um, what, they, what they saw at PLA with us. So we're thrilled to death to hear them today. All right, thank you, Laura. Um, we're gonna start off with Mary Jo Mack. Mary Jo, would you like to go ahead and talk about your experiences at PLA? Well, I'd be happy to. Um, I was lucky enough to go to PLA, and I thought it was a fantastic experience. And I do want to thank the Library Commission for helping to make that possible for me to go there, because I just came back energized, and I really did get a lot of good ideas that I'm going to try and implement into our library. I went to two sessions that I thought were spectacular. The first one was called From Not to Hot, Training Your or Turning Your Unknown or Mediocre Library into a Happening Place in the Community. And that was given by Victoria Ashford. And she is a director of training and consulting. And she just really did, I thought, a fantastic job. I was scribbling notes the whole time during the session. Um, uh, and of course a lot of that ended up being about customer service and how that truly is uh, what library libraries are all about is customer service and getting the, the services to your customers that they need and that they want. The second program I went to that I thought was fantastic was Shortcuts to Greatness or 10 things that, your, that great libraries know and maybe you don't. And this was given by Karen Hyman. And one statement that she made that I, I just thought was profound to me and really made me stop and think was, your library is as friendly as your least friendly employee. And I really got thinking about that. And I decided to do a lot of, or at least some looking at the staff and maybe do some training and have them relook at the way that they greet customers and about customer service. She also said, Karen also said, take a look at your website, at the home page on your website. And she gave, she was really pleased with Houston Public Library's website. So if you get a chance, pull that up, take a look at that. Another one that she liked was Vancouver Public Library. And she said, also take a look at your vision statement. And those are things that I intend to do and work on more throughout the year. Another thing I got to do, and I was really thrilled about this, was I was invited to an author's breakfast. 
And at this breakfast, Kristen, Kristen Hanna was there, Mary Alice Monroe, Philip Marfolin, and Leila Meekham, who wrote Roses. And it was fun hearing them talk about their end of the book writing. Uh, I have never encountered or read any of Mary Alice Monroe's books before, but after hearing her talk, I went and got all of her books for our library and also placed her onto Overdrive. So I just had a great experience. I also thought Portland was very tourist friendly. The train there was so easy to get around and people in Portland I thought were very, very nice. And I thought the, the conference was very well run. So, Did you have more to add? Nope. I can add more at the end if, if you want more, but that's the basic point I wanted to make. But I did for sure want to thank the Library Commission for making this happen for me. Welcome. <laughs> Great. And I do want to just make sure our attendees know as we're going along, feel free to ask questions. If you have questions of any of these individuals, you can either raise your hand. There's a little raise your hand icon next to your name, and that will let us know that you want to ask a question using your microphone. I'll go ahead and unmute you. Or we have the question box where you can go ahead and type in your questions, and I'll be monitoring those and jumping in to interrupt our presenters as those come in. Does anybody have any questions for Mary Jo so far? Okay. Well, then we'll move along to our guests here in the commission. We'll start with Carol Swanson. Tell us about your experience. Okay. Well, I had a very busy time, and I had an agenda when I went. I had gone through... My focus was basically looking um, at facility space usage, um, how to rework a library space um, sort of from the inside out. Um, I have a library that uh, no longer really serves necessarily the best um, use of the customers that come in and use it. We have different formats, we have different niche users that need to be using the space. So I was looking for inspiration as to how other libraries were um, dealing with this problem. And I had a hard time choosing which session to focus on for you all today. Um, I certainly, I went to a session called So You Want a Revolution which was all about the transformation of the range view system library in Colorado. And that is, is certainly an inspiration for all of us. Um, I won't take a lot of time to talk about it now, but they are known as the AnyThink Library. Um, and they have so many innovative ideas that they have put to use that work for them. So I would encourage you to take some time to visit um, range view or anything. They now have an anything tank so that people can also chat about ideas they have for um, innovation. I went to uh, a session presented by the uh, Paco Underhill and Virocell representative. Again, excellent, excellent information that really stresses looking at our building space and usage by the customer how are they using it? How can we um, implement new ways of using our buildings based on that? How can we better um, serve our customers? But the one that I think I, I decided to focus on was presented by Sandra Nelson. And many people know of her because she has done the, the famous um, books on strategic planning and implementation of planning. And this was actually an encore presentation at PLA. They presented it twice um, because I believe they thought it was, it was really um, addressing core values and core visions, the way that we need to look at um, our service, our profession, and our relationship with the people we serve. This was called Reimagine, Reinvent, and Reallocate. And she emphasized that change has become just the byword that we all live by. And I would have to say I came away very much impressed with the fact that change has to be not just something we you know, 
know, put our hands between our heads and say, oh, we have to change. We really do, not to, not to overuse the cliche, we do have to embrace change. We have to realize that change is, is ongoing. It is not um, something that uh, necessarily just takes jumps, we stay static, and then we take a jump and we change. It's ongoing. Everything is changing around us every day, and we have to be alert to this. We have to be alert to this as to how our customers are responding to change, what's working for them, what's not, and then how we can apply that to our own profession, our own uh, facilities. One thing she mentioned was that recession is having a real transformational effect on the way that we do business. There's no going back to the way things used to be. Things will never go back to the way they used to be. Um, social networking, access to the internet, all of that. Um, and that's kind of obvious we're, that we're seeing that. Um, but more and more, and not just in Sandra's session, but in others, um, stress was placed on being very user-centered, um, we're no longer the gatekeepers of the information. Um, what we need to be doing is to encourage uh, content that's generated um, not only by us or acquired by us, but also by our users. That is very important. Um, the fact that we're having increasing diversity in, in all areas of our life, and this is only going to increase. And we have to be looking at how we can address that. Each individual library will have a, a different mix of diversity. And so it's not going to be one size fits all. It's really a matter of getting to know your community and learning what is the best service to give to them. Um, she had a lot of really interesting individual sites that she mentioned. Um, one, and I'm not certain if I'm pronouncing it right, was Aarhus in Denmark. And they took a space in the front of their lobby. And over a series of months, they just used it for various purposes. They had to be a transformation lab. Then they had it be an exhibition lab. Then they made it into a public square where people could come and talk about issues. Um, one time they made it into a huge uh, floor chessboard. It was a way of seeing how people interacted and reacted to uh, different space use in a library. Um, but the outcome was very positive. The people really enjoyed having that space where they actually had co-ownership. You know, they were um, integral to the use of that space. And the outcome was that was simply that users need to have a more visible role in library use. And she went on to contrast and compare different ways that libraries have addressed different user needs in their particular communities. She talked about the use of library parks in um, Medellin, Colombia. And she talked about Imaginon here in um, the Charlotte Mecklenburg and how if you try to create a library park in Charlotte, that would not be the best solution for their needs, nor would an Imaginon be the best use in the country of Colombia. Um, I think another thing that she mentioned is we're very good at doing and succeeding and succeeding and saying this works and not moving on. We have to learn when to move on, when to say we've had a successful use of the space or a successful program, but we need to re-examine and see where else we can go, what else we can do. And this all has to do with what she tied into the fact that we, we need to be transformational rather than transactional. And I don't think this is new either. We've all heard that. But again, when you see um, people actually take that attitude or that philosophy and apply it to the services they're providing, you can see that it comes out with some very different results. 
because of the, the interaction between the community and the library. Um, quickly, she said, as far as reinvent, she said, every two years, look very carefully at what you're doing. Every five years, look very suspiciously at what you're doing. And every 10 years, throw things away and start over. So, I mean, I don't know if, if that is necessarily, but she made some, she made some very good points to support that. Um, and how out of that process, we come to define new uses for space or spaces by new users. And that's all about the way we present ourselves to our users so that they know we are there for them. We're not there for us. We are there for them. Uh, because, again, it's not about us. It is not about us. It's about our customers. And most of the successful ideas, she said, incorporate ideas from outside the library. We need to look outside at what's going on in our community and what's going on with our customers. Um, her last point was about reallocation. Naturally, none of us are looking to get a lot more resources, so uh, you know, there are some tough decisions to be made out there as far as smart reallocation of those resources, and each community will have to make those decisions based on their community needs. And the last thing she left us with was uh, a quote, and I hope I got it right, um, from Peter Drucker, which is, is very uh, good. It says, don't use yesterday's logic to, to solve today's situation. And so I think that that applies to us. You know, we need to look and see where we are today and how we move forward from today to help our customers and, and remain part of their lives. It, it was an excellent conference. I learned so much. Um, and I could keep talking. <laughs> I'll just be quiet now. All right. Well, thank you, Carol. That was sounds like a really interesting session. Does anybody have any questions about Carol's discussion? You can check your link here. Yeah. Okay, then we will move on to Tammy Teasley. Tell us about your experience. When I was approached at work about whether I would be interested in going to PLA, I started looking at the program, and I didn't get past the pre-conferences, and I knew, yes, I want to go. The pre-conference I was wanting to attend was called Putting the Puzzle Together, Managing a Floating Collection. And the reason I wanted to attend is I work in the support services area of the library, and we had started already testing the waters with floating with a couple of our smaller collections. And I thought if this is something that Lincoln City Libraries is going to pursue further, someone probably should know some of the things to plan for, some of the problem areas, and some suggestions to have before we really take this on full, full speed ahead. Um, and I think it's always great to actually hear from people who have gone through the process, who have worked with it for a while, and can share their expertise. Um, the presenters were from Jefferson County Public Library in Wheaton Ridge, Wheat Ridge, Colorado, and from Charlotte Mecklenburg in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, the Colorado Library actually has started floating their collections in 1994, so this is not something that's just the latest fad in library land. Um, the Colorado system has 10 libraries, they serve a population of 548,000, and their circulation is 7 million items. Charlotte Mecklenburg had 24 libraries, I know they're going through closings. Um, their population is 850,000, and they circulate 7,300,000 items. Um, the main point when you're thinking about starting a floating collection, you, the staff really has to make a sh mind shift. You have to go from thinking in terms of, this is my branch, and this is my collection, 
to know we are one system and we have one collection. So you need to get away from that ownership of your individual branch collection and think system-wide. They called it system think. Um, so that's your, your major hurdle you have to get over, is getting the staff to shift their thinking. Uh, why would you consider floating collections? Your first thought would be, oh, you're going to save so much in delivery time. And that's not necessarily true. You may be still delivering the same amount of items, possibly even more. But the point is, you are only going to be delivering items that someone has requested. You're not going to be wasting an item's time just going from point A to point B because that's where it lives, is point B. So some systems did see a decrease in the amount of items delivered, but others didn't. But just the point to keep in mind is your items that are being delivered are the ones that customers have requested. Uh, you will increase the availability of, of materials and you'll increase circulation because the items that aren't in delivery just to get from point A to point B are now immediately available after you've checked them in. You can put them on display, you can put them on a shelf so your customers can find them. Um, and from the customer's point of view, it's like they are constantly seeing new things in a lot of variety because of the way the collection is being used in a floating situation. Uh, of course, you're saving staff time and that's important to us as managers. Um, save time as far as you're not having to sort into bins after check-in and here's the bin that's gone here and here and keeping track of all that stuff. It saves a lot of time in um, the behind the scenes part because you're no longer having to tag things for specific locations. It simplify, simplifies labeling. You have to come up with a consistent um, labeling system throughout. You can't no more individual, this is what we do at this library, put this sticker on it and that sticker on it. You can't do that anymore because it's one collection. Those books are going to be any and everywhere. Um, some of the concerns, uh, what happens when all the horse books end up at one branch? Instead of seeing that as, oh my goodness, you know, the collection is out of balance, again, you're thinking one collection. You still have all those horse books. And if all of those horse books are at one collection, at one location, that's because that's where people want them. Those are the people who want to read your horse books. And so if you have a shelf full of horse books, that's not a problem. That's a good thing because your customers at that location want those books. You need to have a plan on when you get to the point where, yeah, we do have to look at redistributing materials. And they suggested you appoint a redistribution czar. So everything is going through one person. Uh, the request for, hey, I need more items, on, materials on X, or hey, I, have, I need to, to give, a, give someone else these X items. So one person is coordinating. And they said you need to impose a strict no dumping policy. There will be no just putting some books into a tub to send them away without asking the people at the branch that those items are headed to. Um, weeding is essential. They said to do a very deep weed before you even start this process. So to weed with a vengeance. You need to get rid of all your ugly or condition items and all your dated materials. And you need to <coughs> excuse me, constantly check in for the condition at check-in and be sure to keep your collection looking good, so the key things aren't floating. Um, they suggested you have weeding teams, and that they are co they're constantly weeding. 
um, you need to set up um, an approach for how to deal with uh, extra copies when your best sellers, the use of your best sellers have died down. You need to, to come up with an, a plan for pulling in those extra copies. And you need to create a rebalancing plan so that you have an idea of what you're going to do if things do need to be looked at again. Um, again, the biggest obstacle is getting that shift in mindset that you're looking at one uh, collection. And the thing that really hit home with me is our web users are already doing that. When they look at our catalog, they are looking at our entire collection. So if you think of it in those terms, I think I think it kind of makes it clearer. Um, the customers are going to be involved with creating their own collections because of the way they are calling in materials to location. They essentially are creating their collection that they want at that branch. And from their point of view, they are going to be continually seeing new and varied materials. So I think this is a very customer-centered uh, approach to the uh, library system. And it's got, it will increase your circulation, which is very important to everybody. And I think I've covered most of the high points. Um, if there are any questions. And I see that we do have a hand raised. I'm going to go ahead and unmute the microphone. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I have a Would question. You to ask a question? Hello, I have a question for Carol. For Carol, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, go ahead. The question is, uh, yeah, yes. do we have the... Do we have the websites of the places that you were referring to? Will those be in the delicious list? Oh, that's actually a good idea. If you would like to pass those along to me, I can make sure those get up in our we'll, delicious list. We'll get those up for you. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Thank And that goes for any of you. If you mention any interesting links during your presentation, like you send email those to me afterwards, I can make sure those get up and available to everybody along with the recording. Okay, so I guess it's Carrie's turn. Okay. Um, this is my first national conference I got to go to, and it was pretty exciting. Um, and as a as a youth librarian, I um, tried to go to a lot of things on teen advocacy, teen programming, um, new books for kids, things like that. But there are two presentations I went to that I'm most excited about coming back and actually attempting to do here. Um, one was a lady who taught from the Denver Public Library who talked about a display database that she had created. And she used the, um, these tech elements, and I have no um, technology awareness, so I don't know what these are, but MySQL and Cold Fusion. And so I need to talk to our tech guy about getting those, and I don't know what to pay for them or how that works exactly, but um, those are what her tech person used to set up this database that the Denver Public Library uses. And what they do is once they have a display, they tag it, they upload a photo of the display, they upload their sign they made for the display, like advertising what the books are. Um, they might upload a list of books they included in the display, and then they actually rate how well the display circulated. And so by doing this, um, it saves them a lot of time in their display creation. And she had a whole bunch of philosophies about displays. Um, these are some that I liked. Each customer should feel like the first person who sees the display, which means that you need to fluff it, she calls it, every time you walk by. So a display should look brand new and you need to keep it updated. Um, meaning, you know, the same customers come back probably every three weeks, so make sure there's a new display each time they come in. Um, why I really like this idea is because, say, when I go back to my branch this afternoon, and I'm trying to think of something to put up for a new display, all I have to do is go to this database, type in something like spring, or rain, or whatever I'm thinking would be a good display, and 
all of a sudden I'll get a photo of someone else's display they've already made, the sign they use, so I don't need to create a new sign, I just have to print it out, and also um, a list of books they used, which might not work if you have a, a system with different books at each branch, but there might be some key, you know, I'm looking for picture books for my children's display, so there might be some key spring books I want to include in that display. And I think it would be a real time saver, so I plan on talking to our tech person about that. Um, the second program I went to was presented by a panel of two libraries. One was Portland, Oregon Public Library System, and then another library in California. And they both have programs where they train volunteers to go out to their schools and do book talks during the school year. And the, the Oregon program is called Books to You. And they, they have two goals with their program. They want to get kids to do more recreational reading, and they want to make more families aware of library. So they started with low-income schools, and they had some guidelines for that. I think it was like 70% of the students had to be on free or reduced lunch or something like that. That's how they identified their low-income schools. Um, and they have trained approximately 20 volunteers, and they visit these schools four times a year. And when they go in, they talk about five or six books each time, and then they leave two copies of the books in the classroom so the kids can read them on their own. They're not checking them out, they just get to use them and they pick them up when they come back. Um, they have a lot of good handouts on the website, which we're going to talk about next. Um, and so if you go to, if you look at these handouts, they have a lot of, they have all their volunteer requirements, they have applications for volunteers, they talk about all the, um, the training they do with volunteers, they make sure these volunteers feel very confident in the classroom. Um, they have a huge list of books that the volunteers choose from. They teach them how to write book talks. They make them practice book talks. It's, it seems very intensive, but yet it seems very rewarding that it's only taking one staff to train all these volunteers, and these volunteers are making so many contacts in the schools. And the, they, they had a volunteer there who talked about how the kids recognize them at the grocery store, and they know that they're their volunteer for that classroom, and they stay with that classroom, some for 15, 20 years. Do you have more tied up if you want to point out okay. the handouts? Um, yeah, and information for details. Yep. Yep. Right under there, it now says session handouts. And those are all the handouts. Um, the one I just talked about, I think, is quite a ways down. Maybe all the way. <laughs> I just want to search for the title, perhaps. Or, you know. Where is it, Carol? I, w I was just going to comment. I looked through uh, a lot of the handouts. I was looking for handouts for my sessions, which, as I said, there are they didn't seem to appear, but I looked at the session about training volunteers to go out into the schools, and that really seemed like a very, very productive um, Too busy to go. idea. Yeah. That just gives you the information about the school to the right. Mm -hmm. You can close, close this window. Yeah. And scroll over to the right. Uh, okay. Uh, all these all these okay, so you can open up all these. Those are all the handouts. Great. That's wonderful. They have it's available. Mm -hmm. Just one as an example here. And there it is, some internet resources apparently. Oh, some of these windows here. Did you have anything else to add, Terry? No, nope, I just think that would, that's something I'm excited to maybe try out. Great, yeah, that sounds fascinating.
Um, let me just check really quick and see if we have any questions before we move on to our last participant here. We have another hand raised, it looks like. Okay, go ahead. Your microphone is unmuted. Volunteers. Um, I'm a member of the Friends of my local library, and maybe those Friends groups is where those volunteers will be found. Ah, but your Friends groups is a place to find volunteers. That does sound like a good suggestion. Yeah, they also got, um, they use a lot of retired teachers, a lot of um, my, um, like college students that are going to become teachers, or college students that are going to become librarians. Or retired library. Said we're good places to go. Great, sounds good. Okay, let's go ahead with Mary. Tell us about your experience. All right, I'm Mary Lochner, and I am a youth librarian at the Walt Branch Library here in Lincoln. And I want to thank the Nebraska Library Commission for sending us all. Um, besides having outstanding programs at the PLA event, um, it was a great opportunity to meet other librarians from around the country. And just kind of just to see those thousands of people who are all kind of in the same boat as we are, all wanting to serve their communities. It's, it's very empowering that way to know you're, you're not out there <laughs> in the ocean alone. And it also gave me the opportunity to get to know Carrie better, who was my roommate for the the four days out there, um, so that, that was wonderful. Um, I was focusing mainly on things that affected youth, and I, I came up with um, just some, some general things that seemed to come up in every session I went to. And um, of course, everyone around the country is stretched very thin with increased use and decreased funds. So how are people handling this? Uh, one way that was mentioned repeatedly was using what you already have as far as programs and materials and repurposing that to meet another need. Um, some examples of that, one session I went to was um, pregnant and parenting teens. And this librarian from Waukee, Iowa, has set up programs where she does outreach for pregnant and parenting teens, either through the schools or through um, different locations where, where these young people are. And instead of starting from nothing and building up special program for them, she reuses story times that she already does for babies and takes, takes those out. And then her Every Child Ready to Read materials that she has been using to present to other parenting groups, she kind of um, repurposes to use for these groups. So she's not starting from, from the bottom. She has, has materials she can already use for them. Um, Another session I went to was doing after school outreach to after school programs and several of the speakers from the various library systems in that program were talking about how they use programs that they already had produced to do in-house at their libraries and then kind of refine them a bit to make them fit for these after school programs that they were going to. So repurposing what you've already got. Um, another thing I noticed is that people who had very um, specialized programs, that was kind of what they did in their library system. Besides their regular offerings, you cannot do all of these special programs. You don't have the staff for that. So they would take one or two things that really were important to them and work with them. And from our library system here right now, in Lincoln going through a strategic planning thing, I think that will maybe help us select what would be one or two areas that would be big for us. And the one that just really blew me away was um, a homeschooling program. And that was one of the main things I was interested in doing. And my first thought was, whoa, baby, we cannot do this. <laughs> no way, no way could I do that. And it's the um, Mid-Continent Public Library from Kansas City, Missouri. And they do, I can't even remember what they call it now, but an outreach for homeschooling. Um, to have homeschoolers come in, twice a week they do programs for homeschool families, hour-long programs. And these are not just training you how to use library resources, which is what I had kind of thought I would like to start out doing. It is schooling. Their focus is science. 
So every week, well, they'll have a, a four-week program on the planet, the solar system, and each week have a different educational presentation and then, you know, crafts and fun stuff to go with it. But uh, to me, that would be a huge undertaking of time. So obviously, this for them has to be a major focus. They did say that 17 of their 30 branches are participating in this program. So that, that was a really big deal, and I think probably way more than, than what we would have time and energy for. But interesting that they have been able to make it work for them. The third thing that just was, was huge is if you're going to do anything outside the box and it requires money, you have got to write a grant for it. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I need to get a little more experience and try and get grant money. In the homeschooling session I went to, another presenter from Webster, New York, had set up a program of bags of materials that homeschoolers or anyone could check out on particular topics. Uh, we have a similar thing for preschool emphasis in what we call treasure bags. It's like a story time in a bag. This was kind of a, a classroom unit in a bag, like perhaps the planets, you know, books on that, maybe a, a model, you know, of, of the planet, the solar system, other things they could use. But this particular library had an $80,000 grant to get these bags set up because they were rather expensive. So with those three things in mind, I thought you could look at any of the presentations and figure, okay, how, how could we make these work for us? Um, and, and figure, okay, you've got to come up with money, you've got to come up with time, and you've got to be able to kind of repurpose things that you've already done for them. Now, my favorite one was the very first session I went to. It was called Groove and Move, and it was about using more music in story times. And it was absolutely fabulous. If anything energized me, it was that program. It made me feel coming out like, yes, I want to do, do this, and I know I can do it. The two presenters were from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and very, very engaging people. But they, they also both had backgrounds in early education, preschool education, so they, they could give you all the reasons why all these things are important to do, besides how much fun it is. Uh, they, they were emphasizing using music in story times or other programs that you did. And, um, let me see all the reasons why first was fun. I guess I would just have to say it just makes story times more fun. And then, of course, we are all emphasizing the Every Child Ready to Read, the, the core um, things that children need to know to be ready to read, and language development and such. And they're saying that using music, of course, helps with the phonological awareness, the hearing the sounds and words, vocabulary building, narrative skills, and those three mainly, but also with print motivation and print awareness and letter uh, knowledge. Um, they have a lot of handouts that were on the website <laughs> under the session handouts there. And it's one of the top ones, um, just down a couple. Groove and move right there. If you scroll to the right, then those are all the handouts. Um, if you uh, click on that number 59, top one, one. yes, yeah, that is their, these presenters, top 10 songs, top 10 CDs, top websites, and top props that they recommend. Uh, and I did hand that out to our youth staff already. It's just a lot of good ideas. You know, when you're setting up a program or a story time, you don't have hours on end to be researching, uh, trying to find all the good songs. Uh, if you go into print preview, it shows the whole page. For some reason, that oh. it shows half of the page. Um, I was looking at that this morning. There we go. Yeah. So I right away this week tried their top song, Goldfish, from uh, Lori Berkner. And I don't know how many children, <laughs> people are going to be listening to this, but it was fabulous. And it was one of those things that, you know, it's either going to really be great or it's going to be a total flop. <laughs> and it was great. The kids absolutely loved it. And I planned to use it some more. And I hadn't used any of Lori Perkins things before. I mean, I'd heard of her, but I hadn't used her music. And she's very energetic and, and positive, fun kind of things. Um, these presenters use a lot of repetition. They not only use a lot of music, they probably use about four musical either songs or nursery rhymes with music 
the size they're opening and closing song in every story time. But they like to repeat a lot in their points. You know, kids like to do things that they know, and they're only coming once a week. So uh, as opposed to in preschool where you've got them three times a week perhaps, um, but you need to repeat things for them to get to get used to it. So I'm going to be doing that goal for size <laughs> more and more because it was a lot of fun. Um, they, they gave some ideas about doing rhymes. You may be doing the Itsy Bitsy Spider or uh, the Two Little Blackbirds Sitting on the Hill. A lot of those rhymes are very short. When well, you can do them repeatedly by doing them regular, doing them fast, doing them slowly, doing them very loudly, doing them very quietly. So you can um, have, have some repetition. The kids learn them better that way, and they love doing that. I am a super voice, or big, big loud voice. So that, that was a good point that they made. Another point they made, which for some reason I had never thought of before, is some of the music that you use has interlude times or singing times where there aren't motions to do with it. And you think, okay, now what do we do? You know, just stand here and wait for the next action shot. And they said, well, you know, no, you put in your own motion. Like maybe you're tapping your shoulders, flicking your fingers, patting your legs, you know, rolling your hands, things that I thought, well, yeah, of course. Why didn't I ever think of that? But it's nice to have other people present things to you and Things that are really obvious but maybe haven't crossed your mind that can come up. So those were great ideas. The other thing with their presentation, they led the whole group through doing a lot of these songs. And it was all children's libraries. So of course, we are all jumping all over the place and running around the room and doing, doing all these action songs. It was, it was a lot of fun. But it was a good reminder to me that not only do you need a solid program set up when you're going into a program, but presentation is key, you know, and the more energy that you can show to the kids or the adults in the room, uh, I think the more they will get out of it. You have to be upbeat and, and really uh, to do those things. So and that, that was the main thing. I did hear uh, author Kadir Nelson, author and illustrator, and that was wonderful, just a wonderful experience. And I went to that from not to hot program that um, Mary Jo was mentioning, and I thought that was excellent too. And I, even though I'm not an administrator, I liked how this presenter talked about customer service. You're not only serving your external customers or the public, you're also serving your internal customers, she called them, or your staff, you know, how to get them feeling good about what they're doing. And um, she also mentioned other city employees. That was a, a big thing that they reached out to. So um, overall, I, I thought the PLA was a wonderful experience. And I would encourage anyone who has an opportunity to go to and take advantage of it. Great. We do have one comment that was typed in while you were talking to Mary. There's one idea for resources for homeschool educational programming is to have the library set up the events and bring in someone to present them. Lincoln UNL has a program to teach teachers to teach earth science, and the students in this program will be great presenters. A terrific internship opportunity for them, and great for the library. So yes, oh, definitely. That would be a good idea. Community yeah. resources. Uh -huh. Along those same lines, at the minute, one of the programs I went to was uh, called Mashed Media, where uh, libraries from around the country were all involved in this grant to do um, to to teach kids how to make video games and such. They used a program called Scratch. But they, of course, got a lot of volunteers, a lot of teen volunteers to help them. And we are usually thinking of, okay, the teens at the local high school, the ones that need hours for their government and politics class, or we're thinking of potential library science students. Well, what they went out to was computer programmers and engineering students and got them to come in and work with them. And I thought, okay, this is the thinking outside the box. You know, it doesn't all have to be librarians working on this, you can get people like, like that suggestion of educators or people from other fields and tap into that as a resource and get them to work with you. Your, your comment, Mary, in most all of the sessions that I attended, they talked about collaboration, reaching out into the community as being a necessity. It's no longer an option, it's a necessity. So when we talked about the comment that was um, sent in to us or what you were talking about the idea of trying to find people to help us with grants, that's, that's all part of it. And um, I know when I went to the Anything uh, presentation about Rangeview, Colorado, um, they talked about having a revolution. And uh, in the presentation that Sandra Nelson did, she said sometimes it's not always 
um, necessarily a revolution, but an evolution can lead to that where you know, you might not be thinking totally outside the box, but you're tweaking your thinking, and that can lead. So sometimes you, you take smaller steps. Sometimes they are gigantic steps. But the important thing is to always look for ways to um, get outside of where you are at the moment to improve. Great. Well, everybody's had a chance to talk about their experiences. Does anybody, any of you, Mary Jo, any of you have any final thoughts to add? Your opinion of the conference overall? Well, I'd I like to make... add, yes, we, we certainly want to thank the Library Commission for, you know, making it possible in our library, making it possible for us to go. And it was a very well organized event, even though there were several thousand people there. What was nice is you could go from session to session within the same conference hall so that you didn't necessarily have to worry about missing a lot of things or missing getting to see the vendors, mm -hmm. which is an education in itself, mm -hmm. um, because you were you know, going from hotel to hotel or location to location. It was very well organized. Great. That's one tip I would have is if you ever attend, plan out a strategy for the exhibits. <laughs> Sounds good. Mary Jo, did you have something you were going to say? Oh, I just wanted to mention that I also went to Book Buzz by Nancy Pearl. And if anyone else went to that, I think it's great because it's, they had different publishers there telling about books that are upcoming that they think are going to be good. And a lot of times they gave galleys away for those. And they have a website for librarians. It's called uh, www.earlyword.com. And you can go on there and you can discuss some of these galleys that were picked up at conference or even find out ahead of time what books are going to be coming out. Great. That sounds like I, a great resource. If you go ahead and send me that link, I'll make sure that gets up with the recording so that everybody can access that website. All right, are there any last minute questions? We've got a few more minutes here. Does anybody have any questions for our presenters? I kind of had a question, and I, I'm sorry if this puts you on the spot, but was coming here and talking about this stuff okay? Yeah. yeah. So sharing it yeah. was kind of fun. A lot so easier I than I anticipated. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I, I Good. think the hard part is is actually narrowly yes. what you're going to focus in on, uh -huh. and because one topic, um, a lot of times will relate to another topic that you attended, mm -hmm. and there are so many good ideas, and then out of that you start to think like this. So I think it's more how do I limit? How do I pick the yeah. most mm -hmm. choice little morsel? Mm -hmm. And that's. The thing. But do you think you could say someone else who was thinking about giving a presentation that no it wasn't scary. Especially in a panel setting. Good. 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 All right. And one last quick check for questions. All right, it looks like that is it. Well, thank you all for joining us. Mary Jo, thank you for joining us over the web. And thank you to my in-person guests here and Laura as well. And thank you. thank you all for attending. And we hope you'll come back and join us for another Encompass Live. <laughs>